when thinking about research in, in a post-COVID world, um, there's four different uh, points that I want to highlight on um, in the way in which you know, this um, uh, and the way in which this pandemic has affected our uh, research lives. Um, and the first is, you know, the uh, the question of um, um, the question of uh, you know, getting on the um, the COVID bandwagon of research. And um, here I'm um, I'm sort of you know referring to the um, th there is a way in which um, you know COVID uh, 19 has become um, the primary lens through which all of reality is you know experienced um, so I mean the uh, our media exposure has of course you know increased exponentially and um, it, it appears as if um, even in the realm of uh, social sciences as well as you know the other sciences um, there, there is an increased urgency and an emphasis on, um, on COVID um, research. Um, in institutions, you can see this in uh, academic institutions uh, across the world. You can see this in the kinds of uh, uh, funding calls which have come out from you know, funding um, agencies. And the, uh, the sort of you know, implicit you know, assumption there um, is that, um, um, that COVID COVID-related research or COVID-related you know, related academic work has much more primacy, much more importance, much more relevance than any other kind, any other kind of social science engagement. And, and that then raises a question about, you know, how do we really understand then um, all other kinds of, you know, academic work or research, which is uh, being carried out in um, in various other domains that um, uh, that previously may have had little connection with um, uh, you know with the with the pandemic. Uh, so how the primary question which you know I'm bringing up here, and this is also perhaps the key um, the key thematic or thread you know in my talk is you know the question of value. What are the forms of value? Um, which are um, you know, what forms of you know research, what forms of you know uh, academic pursuit or uh, or engagement, right, um, are being valued more, and what does that really say about um, about us as a as a society in general? And um, I mean, both uh, Professor uh, Srivastava as well as you know Dr. Saiba. Uh, talked about how in many ways the pandemic has really just sort of sharpened and uh, brought into focus the kinds of you know inequalities the kinds of marginalities that already have you know been um, um, existing in uh, society and that is something which comes through much more clearly when you when you see um, what gets valued more including what gets valued more in um, uh, in research as well um, so while on the one hand there is a pressing you know, worldwide you know, emergency kind of scenario and again an emergency situation which just seems to be never ending um, so that you know, um, the biomedical researchers are invested in you know, the development of drugs, vaccines or ventilators, um, epidemiologists, statisticians, virologists and others are modeling the path of you know, the virus across the globe. Um, economists are measuring and speculating about the impact on economies, livelihoods, markets. Um, psychologists are talking about, you know, mental health and psychological ramifications of the pandemic. Um, anthropologists and sociologists are considering, you know, various issues such as uh, media exposure, as well as how assessments and judgments about risk, uncertainty, and, and fear impact people's notions of health, illness, and disease. Um, but what is really striking is that um, uh, every day seems to you know, bring forth not just new research findings in you know, our daily new capsules of health news. And it's, it's uh, really amazing the way in which you know, health news uh, has sort of you know, taken over our um, our sort of mental and you know mind space uh, in a way um, 
but um, uh, but also the the pace with which these um, uh, these uh, these findings are also sort of changing, right? So we have seen over the past few months how um, you know the uh, position of um, uh, of let's say flagship you know, medical and health organizations or uh, like the World Health Organization has changed. For instance, with respect to uh, decrees about you know uh, about face masks. Uh, at one point of time, in the early days of you know the pandemic, the uh, the kind of advisories were very different about you know the importance of face masks. Today, the kind of um, uh, advisories which are you know issued are um, are very different. Where the face mask has suddenly assumed much more importance um, and uh, you know seen as being you know much more uh, you know effective. So uh, I think it's important to also acknowledge that. Um, um, that there we are living, of course, in times of uncertainty and um, a, what appears to be a sort of you know uh, endless kind of you know uncertainty, um, and also that uh, we are living at a time uh, in a time when although there is much more information which is made available to us, um, uh, it's also a time of you know. Um, uh, you know, fake news and changing, you know, information and um, uh, where uh, for many different aspects, one doesn't really know uh, for sure. There is a lot of, you know, uncertainty. There is a lot which is, uh, which is unknown. And, um, and, and therefore, in trying to also, you know, make sense of, you know, make sense of what is going on, make sense of uh, the pandemic, it, it, it's also a process of trying to sort of you know, keep up with um, uh, with all which is going on. So what does that have to do with research? It also implies that any research, um, any social science or mental health research, um, uh, uh, which is, you know, COVID um, related, and in some ways, you know, all, all research, of course, now is uh, COVID related or COVID impacted in you know, different ways. Uh, but any of you know this kind of research also has to acknowledge um, that that it is very it is very finite or it is very contextual and very uh, time specific. Uh, so Professor uh, Vinesh Vivasava, you know, spoke about the importance of context, uh, you know, in anthropology, and I think that's really important. You know, local context, local local particularities, what is happening at a particular point of time in a particular you know, given place to a particular, you know, group of, you know, individuals. And so therefore, uh, uh, how, that, that, in, that particularly impacts certain kinds of, you know, social science um, research, which is much more long term, which is much more qualitative, which is, you know, sustained over a long period of time, right? Um, because it, it, in, it, um, in, it automatically implies the need to also ensure uh, responsiveness to the changing context of the field, and you know, being iterative in one's uh, in one's methodology, in, including the um, uh, including the changing scenarios, responding to that, and being willing to be much more flexible to alter one's you know research questions or research agendas based on what the field really throws up. Um, so the, so the second uh, point that I wanted to talk about when thinking about you know how um, um, the COVID situation affects uh, social science research is uh, is about you know the COVID lens for research and the impossibility of you know doing any kind of you know research without adopting a COVID lens right even if one is not engaged in COVID related research so to speak um, it is impossible to not sort of you know have um, a, a COVID lens. And what that means uh, thinking about what are the specific ways in which one's own, you know, research uh, project and one's own uh, research participants are affected by, uh, by the pandemic. Uh, and of course, I mean, this is, this is a question which, um, uh, which is also um, uh, uh, possible to, you know, execute with certain kinds of research, much more difficult in, uh, you know, other, other kinds of research. Um, the third uh, point that I want to talk about and to, you know, dwell um, a little bit more on is 
um, uh, in thinking about how, you know, what research in a post-COVID world looks like is COVID-impacted research. Right? Um, ways in which one's um, research project, research questions are very directly impacted, impacted uh, by COVID. Um, and here I'd like to sort of, you know, spend a little bit of time to think about some of the questions which arise. Um, and I hope that, you know, these, um, these would provide us with some um, some opportunities or some, uh, you know, uh, would, would sort of just um, um, uh, spur people to, you know, think a little bit more about, you know, these questions before sort of, you know, jumping into, you know, any kind of um, um, research agenda. So the first is, of course, you know, the question of fieldwork and data collection, uh, which has completely different sort of, you know, meanings now. And uh, so, for instance, if one is engaged typically in, um, you know, immersive kind of anthropological or, um, uh, you know, long-term fieldwork, right, uh, then what are the kinds of, you know, possibilities now? If one is typically engaged in um, in uh, in-person, face-to-face kind of research, which requires, you know, a physical kind of presence, right? Clearly, that kind of you know research is not possible in a given you know under the circumstances, and and this is of course a you know a long term situation. That kind of research is not going to be possible for for uh, for certain months to follow. Um, so if that kind of you know data collection, right, um, which for instance you know long term field work or in person face to face interviews, right, or observations, right, uh, participant you know, observation, if that kind of research is not, you know, possible, the traditional, traditional kind of, you know, fieldwork methodologies, right? Um, then the question is not just, you know, what are the alternatives uh, which a researcher needs to engage in, but, but also in the long run, what does this really mean for um, the discipline itself and the social sciences more generally? What does it really mean? There are important implications here. And uh, in um, over the past few months, you know, I, I looked at the kind of, you know, funding calls which have come out for, you know, COVID research because, uh, you know, of course, various kinds of, you know, funding bodies have, have brought out calls for, you know, COVID-related research. And um, it's interesting to see um, the way in which, you know, certain kinds of, you know, questions are, you know, being given emphasis. Um, so, for instance, in, um, um, in one of the, you know, sort of, uh, um, uh, in one of the articles uh, brought out um, by the Rockefeller Foundation, right, um, where they talk about the, the importance of the importance of big data and data science and they talk about in, in that article um so the, the article is really about where social science research should go um, it's titled rewiring how we measure impact in a post-covid 19 world and it's talking about okay how do we how, do, how does one evaluate and measure the impact of social science research in a post-covid world but what really struck me was the sort of um, you know the emphasis on on data on big data on a real time analysis of data on real time reporting of data and um, i'd like to quote a little bit from you know their um, uh, website um, here where um, um, when when talking about you know the what does social science social research and evaluation look like post COVID nineteen and here I quote um, they say in a new post COVID nineteen world we imagine that traditional in person data collection will be hindered and real time analysis of data and on demand reporting will become a requirement for all types of research and evaluation efforts. As such, leveraging and combining administrative, transactional, and big data sets like satellite images, household survey data, program administrative data, social media analytics, phone call center data, the information generated through mobile phones and internet searches, to name just a few, are going to become key sources of data for research and evaluation specialists. Um, so it's um, it, it is interesting that 
um, the Rockefeller Foundation sort of chooses to explicitly mention that you know a certain kind of you know research is going to have a certain kind of you know uh, value, right? So what does that really mean for um, for social scientists who are you know, engaged in um, in very different kinds of you know um, research with communities? Who um, who cannot necessarily who will not who cannot necessarily be studied through the kinds of remote uh, remote research methods which are being advocated, right? And that's where I come to questions of exclusion and representation. I mean, the questions of exclusion and representation are really uh, very primary when thinking about the way in which our lives have been impacted by you know, the pandemic. And we've seen that uh, we've seen that worldwide. We've seen that also in India, right? Um, but questions of exclusion and representation will also become extremely important when thinking about how are we going to understand, how are we going to really carry out mental health and social science research? Who are the kinds of, or who are the categories of uh, participants or interlocutors who will naturally find themselves within our research project because they can be studied through uh, remote res uh, research methods, remote data collection methods, whether through online interviews or through you know, telephone calls, and who are the kinds of uh, persons who automatically or very naturally would get left out, right? How do we make sure that we uh, we also include um, you know, the perspectives of uh, the most marginalized? So one of the things which you know Professor Shivasava talked about was. Uh, was about you know trying to you know avoid and stay away from a middle class bias, which uh, which I think is very important. But at the same time, it is also something which is going to increasingly become much more difficult to uh, you know to execute, right? Um, and so this is something which um, which I think any you know research question because if you're studying issues of uh, mental health, it's really about distress. And if you are interested in questions of distress, then um, those who are most affected by you know, the COVID pandemic are perhaps not those who can very easily be you know, studied through these online um, approaches. So this is something which, uh, uh, which needs to be kept in mind. The other is um, questions of time. And again, uh, time is also very much related to value because uh, we are also talking about, um, um, uh, we're talk I think time becomes important in, in, in so many, so many different ways, right? Um, so time, uh, time becomes important when you think of, you know, the length of, you know, engagement or research with, you know, participants, right? And uh, on the one hand, while there is a lot of emphasis on Quick research, rapid research. So, for instance, in the um, in the Social Science Research Council, the SSRC's um, you know funding uh, call, right? Um, there are funding calls for three month research projects on COVID nineteen, right? And that says a lot about what kinds of you know research we are valuing at this point of time, right? Um, so there is there is an expectation that the situation will change quite dramatically um, within three months, which is a valid expe expectation. I mean, we do acknowledge that. But at the same time, um, uh, what having a sustained engagement with the field over a long period of time also is very valuable in different ways. Right? So questions of time become, become very important. Um, the questions of um, of how much time one sort of is, you know, willing to, in a sense, steal away from uh, participants for their involvement in our research, right? As they are trying to also uh, compete with multiple other uh, responsibilities in their lives and, you know, in their work, that is also something to be kept in mind. Right? So, um, in engaging in any kind of, you know, research, uh, it's also extremely important to, um, you know, to reflexively be aware of how much of a burden the researcher is also, you know, is adding to, um, uh, to participants who are already uh, managing multiple, you know, different um, 
things at the same time. And I will talk about, you know, that a little bit um, uh, later. Uh, and this is why I say that, you know, que questions of value are really, uh, have really sort of, you know, uh, come to the... Um, so the, the fourth uh, way in which um, um, uh, the, the pandemic, uh, you know, COVID um, and COVID research is, is sort of, you know, impacting our lives is to sort of recognize that any kind of, you know, research which, you know, is uh, being done at this point of time uh, is being done, you know, with COVID impacted, you know, lives. Uh, that includes, you know, not just, of course, you know, the, the lives of the participants or, you know, those research, but also the researchers, you know, themselves. So what does it mean to be surviving and doing research in, you know, in a COVID world, right? Where there are challenges for, uh, for participants, right? And there are also challenges for, you know, the researcher, right? Uh, challenges in terms of, um, uh, you know, making, uh, making allowances for the kind of, you know, investments in, in time, investments in you know, research. So who, so, so the question really, which, I'm asking here is who is, you know, which is something which, you know, as a society overall, I think we have to think of is, you know, who is, uh, who is benefited uh, more, more or who is affected less by, you know, these issues. Um, and um, clearly, I mean, this is also a question for, you know, academia in general, because uh, the pandemic has, of course, you know, differentially affected different groups of, you know, academics. So while, um, and, and, and um, uh, recall this, you know, very important um, um, study, which, you know, which came out um, uh, early on in April in um, um, either I think the British Medical Journal or in the Lancet, I can't remember exactly, you know, which one, uh, but one of these, you know, prestigious journals, which talked about how um, in, you know, in that, in that one month, right, in uh, March and April, while uh, it was quite evident in terms of, you know, the number of papers published that the number of papers published um, uh, by male researchers was much higher in 2020 as compared to 2019. Whereas when um, considering um, uh, the same data for the, you know, the number of papers published by women, in 2020 was drastically less than in 2019. And the article also talked about how um, this was largely due to the fewer numbers of papers submitted by female academics in 2020, in, that is in spring of 2020, as opposed to the number of articles submitted by male academics um, in the spring of you know, 2020. So clearly, and, and there have been you know, different you know, articles um, um, and a different even blog posts in, let's say, the London School of Economics there was a blog post on the female academic and thinking about, you know, how is, um, how is a female academic um, actually impacted by, uh, by the pandemic? And um, uh, it's important to recognize that there is a differential impact. So, um, so this somewhere does need to, you know, be, be factored in. And so therefore, uh, what are the kinds of, you know, research which will, uh, will become possible through the pandemic, but also who are, the, who, are the, who are the kinds of, you know, researchers who are much more likely to be able to carry on with their, um, with their academic and, you know, research uh, lives vis-a-vis uh, -vis others who, are, who might be much more, you know, unable to, you know, do the same or which might be much more affected because of, you know, um, because of either the kinds of care responsibilities they have, the nature of the houses that, you know, um, they live in, the um, uh, gender relations. So all of these are important uh, things to uh, keep in mind. And all of this raises questions of impact and value, which I think it is important to, you know, um, uh, keep in mind and to acknowledge that any kind of, you know, research, uh, particularly research on distress and you know, well-being, uh, 
uh, has to sort of you know be sensitive to um, uh, to these questions. Has where you know researchers uh, have to sort of you know understand or uh, have to ensure that um, they do not uh, a, a burden participants or burden researchers also even uh, much more um, than in non pandemic times. And so I'd, I'd like to sort of you know uh, here bring in. Um, the idea or you know the, the concept of slow research and uh, drawing from you know an, uh, a drawing from an article you know published by Vincan Adams and you know, colleagues in 2014 where the sort of you know, clarion call for um, for engaging in uh, you know a new movement in global health and slow research and um, in their article they talk about you know the importance of of, of slow research, the importance of pauses in um, social science research, and uh, and I think uh, you know although this was um, uh, written a few years ago, it's striking how um, how important it is at this point of time as well. Right? So um, and here I'll quote you know, where they talk about in academic and activist fields of global health. Yeah, Dr. Shaba, Dr. Shaba, if if yes. uh, I'm a, I'm afraid I'll have to interrupt you in um, between. I can see a restless audience waiting to get some answers of your questions, and time is also running short. So if you don't mind, uh, can you just maybe wrap up in a few a uh, few seconds, and then I can raise one or two questions. Yeah, would that I mean, be fine? I am towards the end of you know the talk. Yeah, right. sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So at, at this point of time, I think it is it is really important to um, uh, to bring in the idea of you know of engaging in slow research where we are uh, not necessarily being sort of you know taken in by the kinds of demands which are being you know placed um, by funding agencies, by institutions, by and even by the society context, but also. Um, engaging in you know uh, research which involves you know pauses which you know focuses on um, the local context and uh, you know particularities which um, which involves long term and sustained engagement right and at the same time which is committed to you know public engagement so I think it's really important to um, um, you know, to, to, to sort of you know recognize uh, the value of you know slow research here. And um, this is also drawing from, you know, the larger slow food movement and also the slow science movement where, uh, uh, you know, the slow science movement, you know, basically is one that deliberately sort of resists, you know, and resists conformist kind of, you know, research where you know, one is just taken in by different kinds of, you know, research agendas at, you know, a particular point of time, but is also engaging with the social context, right? Um, so I'd like to sort of, you know, end with, a, you know, a quote from the Slow Science Ma Manifesto, um, um, which is that science needs time to think, science needs time to read, and time to fail, right? So with that, I'd like to end. Thank you very much for your patience.